The first day of our camping trip was perfect. We hiked deep into the forest, set up our tents by a picturesque stream, and spent the afternoon relaxing by the water. The clear, cold stream seemed like a great place to refill our water bottles. None of us thought twice about drinking from it. We had done this countless times before on other trips. As the sun began to set, we built a fire, cooked our dinner, and settled in for what we expected to be a peaceful night under the stars. But as the night wore on, a strange unease crept over us. It started with a slight nausea, then stomach cramps. By midnight, it had escalated to violent vomiting and diarrhea. Each of us was struck down, one by one, too weak to move far from our tents. I lay on the ground, my body racked with pain and chills, trying to piece together what had happened. The realization hit me like a punch to the gut, the water. The stream, which had seemed so pure, must have been contaminated. Panic set in. We were miles from civilization, deep in the forest with no immediate way to get help. Morning came slowly, bringing no relief. The sun's warmth did nothing to alleviate the chills running through me. My friends were in no better shape, each of us struggling with the same debilitating symptoms. We were dehydrated, weak, and getting worse by the hour. I forced myself to think clearly, to push through the haze of sickness. We had no cell service, no way to call for help. Our only option was to try to make it back to the trailhead where we had parked our car. It was several miles away, but it might as well have been on another continent given our condition. With great effort we packed up our gear. Every movement was torture, every step a battle. We took turns helping each other, but progress was painfully slow. I could see the desperation in my friend's eyes. We were running out of time and strength. Hours passed as we stumbled through the forest. The sun climbed higher, and the temperature rose, adding to our misery. I could barely keep track of our direction, my vision blurring and my head pounding. I prayed we were still heading the right way. At some point I collapsed, unable to go any further. My friends were in no better shape. It felt like the end. But then I heard it, a faint sound, the rumble of an engine. Summoning the last of my strength, I crawled towards the sound. My friends followed, driven by sheer willpower. We broke through the trees and saw a ranger's truck on a dirt road. Relief flooded through me. We waved frantically, and the ranger saw us, rushing over with a look of alarm. He radioed for help, and soon we were being tended to by paramedics. As I lay in the ambulance, the four rehydrating me and the oxygen helping me breathe, I felt an overwhelming sense of gratitude. We had made it. It was a narrow escape, but we were alive. The doctors later confirmed that we had suffered from severe bacterial contamination, likely from animal waste upstream. It was a stark reminder of how vulnerable we are, even in nature's beauty. The experience changed us all. We learned to respect the wilderness more, to take no chances with our health. We invested in water purification equipment, always prepared for our next adventure. And though the memory of that harrowing night stayed with us, it also made us stronger, more resilient. We knew that no matter how tough things got, we could survive if we stuck together. Our camping trip started like any other, filled with excitement and anticipation. We found a perfect spot deep in the forest, far from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. The air was fresh, and the serenity of the woods enveloped us. We set up our tents, built a fire, and enjoyed a peaceful evening under the stars. The next morning, we decided to hike to a nearby viewpoint. The trail was challenging but rewarding, offering stunning vistas of the surrounding forest. As we sat at the top, taking in the beauty, I noticed a faint smell of smoke in the air. At first, I thought it was from our campfire, but then I saw a thin plume of smoke rising in the distance. My stomach tightened with a sense of foreboding. We hurried back to camp, the smell of smoke growing stronger with each step. By the time we arrived, the sky had turned a hazy orange, and the air was thick with the acrid scent of burning wood. 
My heart raced as I realized we were in serious danger. A wildfire had started, and it was spreading fast. Panic set in as we quickly packed our gear, but it was clear we needed to leave most of it behind. Speed was our only chance of survival. We grabbed our essentials and set off, hoping to find a safe route out of the forest. The wind had picked up, fanning the flames and driving the fire towards us. The trail we had taken in was already blocked by flames, so we had to find an alternative path. The forest, once a haven, had become a maze of smoke and fire. We moved quickly, our eyes stinging and lungs burning from the smoke. The heat was intense, and the roar of the fire was deafening. As we navigated through the trees, I felt a profound sense of fear. The fire was unpredictable, changing direction with the wind. We stumbled upon a small creek, and for a moment, I felt a glimmer of hope. We followed it, using the water as a guide and a barrier between us and the flames. Hours passed, each minute feeling like an eternity. We were exhausted, our clothes singed, and our bodies covered in soot. The fire had cut off many of our escape routes, forcing us to backtrack and find new paths. It was a relentless race against time. Finally, we reached a clearing, and I saw the outline of a road in the distance. My heart surged with relief. We pushed forward, the fire still raging behind us. When we reached the road, we flagged down a passing car, and the driver quickly called for help. Soon, firefighters arrived, guiding us to safety and treating us for smoke inhalation and minor burns. Sitting in the back of the ambulance, I felt a mixture of exhaustion and gratitude. We had made it out alive, but the experience had left a deep mark. The memory of the wildfire's roar and the searing heat would stay with us forever. The firefighters later told us that the fire had been started by a careless camper miles away. It was a stark reminder of how fragile our safety is in the wilderness. Despite the trauma, we vowed to return to nature, but with a newfound respect and caution. The forest would eventually heal, and so would we. But the lesson we learned was clear. Nature's beauty is matched only by its power, and both must be respected if we are to enjoy and preserve it. Our camping trip began with a sense of adventure and the thrill of exploring a remote part of the forest. We had all been looking forward to this getaway, a chance to disconnect from our busy lives and reconnect with nature. We set up our tents in a small clearing, surrounded by towering trees and the soothing sounds of the forest. The first day was uneventful and peaceful. We hiked, fished in a nearby stream, and enjoyed the tranquility. By nightfall, we were exhausted but happy, gathering around the campfire to share stories and roast marshmallows. The stars above were bright and clear, and we fell asleep easily, lulled by the sounds of crickets and rustling leaves. The next morning, we decided to explore deeper into the woods. As we ventured further from our campsite, the terrain became rougher and the forest denser. I was leading the group when I noticed something unusual on the ground a crude, rusted trap, its metal jaws wide open. I stopped abruptly, my heart pounding as I realized how close I had come to stepping into it. We all gathered around the trap, examining it with a mix of fear and curiosity. It was clearly designed for catching large animals, but the thought of someone setting such dangerous devices in the forest filled me with unease. We decided to head back to our campsite, but as we turned to leave, we stumbled upon another trap, then another. It quickly became clear that the forest was littered with these hidden dangers. Every step felt like a potential disaster. The mood shifted from adventurous to tense. We moved slowly, scanning the ground and the surrounding underbrush for any sign of more traps. My senses were heightened, every sound making me jump, every shadow a potential threat. As we navigated our way back, the traps became more frequent and more cunningly hidden. Some were covered with leaves and branches, others placed in narrow paths where they were hard to avoid. My anxiety grew with each one we discovered. It was obvious someone had gone to great lengths to set these traps, 
and the realization that we were in a poacher's territory made my skin crawl. Hours passed, and progress was painfully slow. We were exhausted, nerves frayed from the constant vigilance. The forest, once a source of joy, now felt like a prison, each step potentially fatal. At one point, we had to detour around a particularly dense area of traps, which led us further off our intended path. Dusk began to fall, and the thought of navigating these traps in the dark was terrifying. We had to find a way out before nightfall. I felt a growing sense of desperation, knowing we were running out of time. Then, as the light faded, we stumbled upon a small clearing, and in the middle of it, an old cabin came into view. The cabin was dilapidated, its windows broken and door hanging askew. But it was shelter, a place where we could regroup and plan our next move. We carefully approached, wary of more traps, and made our way inside. The interior was musty and filled with discarded items, but it felt safer than the trap-laden forest outside. We spent the night in the cabin, taking turns keeping watch. Every creak of the wood and rustle of leaves outside kept us on edge. The fear that the poacher might return was ever-present, but exhaustion eventually took its toll, and we dozed off in shifts. With the first light of dawn, we prepared to leave. Using the map and compass, we planned a direct route back to the trailhead, avoiding the areas where we had encountered the most traps. The journey was still fraught with danger, but the daylight made it easier to spot and avoid the traps. After several grueling hours, we finally broke through the trees and onto the main trail. Relief washed over us as we saw our cars in the distance. We quickly reported the traps and our experience to the park rangers. They assured us they would investigate and remove the traps and hunt down the person responsible. The drive back home was quiet, each of us lost in our thoughts. The trip had turned from a pleasant escape to a harrowing ordeal, a stark reminder of the hidden dangers that can lurk in the most unexpected places. We knew we would camp again, but we would never forget the lessons learned from that perilous journey through the forest of traps. We arrived at the campsite early in the afternoon, excited to spend the weekend hiking and exploring the forest. The trailhead was well marked, and we set off with a sense of adventure, eager to immerse ourselves in nature. The weather was perfect, the sky clear, and the air fresh with the scent of pine. The hike started out beautifully. We followed the trail markers, enjoying the sights and sounds of the forest. Birds sang in the trees, and a gentle breeze rustled the leaves. We took a break by a small stream, refilling our water bottles and sharing snacks. Everything seemed perfect. As we continued I noticed something odd. A trail marker looked different, almost as if it had been moved. I brushed it off as a mistake, but then we saw another marker pointing in a direction that didn't make sense. We followed it anyway, thinking it might lead to a new path. Hours passed, and the sun began to dip lower in the sky. We hadn't reached any of the landmarks the map indicated. Instead, we kept seeing the same areas, the same distinctive trees, the same fallen logs. A growing unease settled over us as we realized we were going in circles. We stopped to reassess. My friend pulled out the map and compass, trying to figure out where we had gone wrong. But the more we looked, the more it became clear. The trail markers had been tampered with. Someone had deliberately moved them to lead us astray. Nightfall was approaching, and the forest started to take on a more sinister feel. Shadows lengthened, and the sounds of the day were replaced by the eerie calls of night creatures. We decided to make camp where we were, not wanting to risk getting further lost in the dark. As we gathered wood for a fire, a disturbing thought crossed my mind. What if someone was out here, watching us? Someone who had moved the markers, intending for us to get lost. My heart pounded as I scanned the surrounding trees, seeing nothing but feeling the weight of unseen eyes. The fire provided some comfort, its warmth and light a small barrier against the encroaching darkness. We ate a simple meal, trying to stay calm and think of a plan. But the sense of being watched wouldn't go away. 
Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves had us on edge. We decided to take turns keeping watch, the firelight flickering as we huddled close together. The night was long and filled with tension. Every now and then, I thought I saw movement in the shadows, but it was always just out of sight, never clear enough to be sure. Morning couldn't come fast enough. With the first light of dawn, we packed up and set out, determined to find our way back. We ignored the trail markers and relied solely on the compass and map. It was slow going, every step filled with anxiety. After several hours, we heard a sound that filled us with relief, the distant hum of traffic. We pushed forward, finally breaking through the tree line and onto a road. We had made it out. Back in the safety of our campsite, we reported what had happened to the park rangers. They promised to investigate, but there was little they could do without more information. We packed up and left, shaken by the experience. The memory of that night stayed with us. The feeling of being lost, of being watched, haunted our thoughts. We never found out who had moved the markers or why, but the incident left a mark on us all. It was a harsh reminder that the wilderness holds dangers beyond the natural, and that sometimes, the greatest threats come from the shadows of our own fears. We had been planning this camping trip for months. It was supposed to be a chance for us to unwind, disconnect from our hectic lives, and enjoy the peace and quiet of nature. Our group of six friends arrived at the campsite on a sunny Friday afternoon. We set up our tents, gathered wood for the fire, and cooked a simple meal. As the sun began to set, we settled around the campfire, sharing stories and laughter. It was during that first evening that I first noticed something strange. I saw a shadowy figure standing at the edge of the forest, barely visible in the dim light. I blinked, thinking my eyes were playing tricks on me, but when I looked again, the figure was still there. It was too far away to make out any details, but it was unmistakably a person. I nudged my friend Mark and pointed towards the figure, but when he looked, it was gone. He laughed it off, telling me I was seeing things, but I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling. The next day, we spent our time hiking and exploring the area. The weather was perfect, and the scenery was beautiful, but I couldn't fully enjoy it. Every so often, I would catch a glimpse of the figure again, always at a distance, always watching. It never approached, never made a sound. I tried to focus on the fun we were having, but the sense of being watched stayed with me. That night, as we sat around the campfire again, I felt the figure's presence more intensely. It was as if it was closer now, just beyond the reach of the firelight. I could see the tension building among my friends. They were starting to notice the figure too. The laughter and conversations grew quieter, replaced by nervous glances into the darkness. On the third day, we decided to confront our fear. We split into pairs and carefully combed the area around our campsite, but we found nothing. No footprints, no signs of anyone else being there. It was unsettling. We tried to go about our day, but the mood had changed. We were all on edge, jumping at every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig. That night, as we huddled around the fire, the figure appeared again, closer than ever before. This time, we all saw it. A wave of fear washed over us. We shouted at it, but it remained silent and still. We threw rocks in its direction, hoping to scare it away, but it didn't move. It was as if it was daring us to come closer. We decided to stick together and keep the fire burning all night. Sleep was impossible. We took turns keeping watch, but the figure remained unmoving, watching. As dawn approached, the figure finally disappeared into the forest. We packed up our campsite in silence, eager to leave. As we drove away, I kept looking back, half expecting to see the figure following us. But it was gone. The feeling of being watched lingered, though. We didn't talk much on the way home, each of us lost in our thoughts. Back in the safety of our homes, we tried to make sense of what had happened. Maybe it was a prank, someone messing with us. 
or perhaps it was just our minds playing tricks after all. We never figured it out, but one thing was certain, the fear we felt was real. It was a reminder of how vulnerable we are, even in the midst of friends and nature. We decided not to let the experience ruin our love for camping, but it did change us. We became more cautious, more aware of our surroundings. And though we never saw the figure again, the memory of those silent, watching eyes stayed with us, a haunting reminder of the unknown that lurks in the darkness. We had chosen a remote spot deep in the forest for our camping trip. It was supposed to be a weekend of relaxation and bonding for our group of five friends. The first day was perfect. We hiked, cooked over an open fire, and enjoyed the tranquility that only nature can offer. By nightfall, we were all tired but content, settling into our tents under a blanket of stars. The next morning, I woke up early, expecting to see Emily, our usual early riser, preparing breakfast. But her tent was empty. At first, I thought she had gone for a walk or to the stream nearby to wash up. But as time passed and she didn't return, our concern grew. We started calling her name, spreading out to search the immediate area. There was no sign of her. Her belongings were untouched, her boots still by the tent. A sinking feeling settled in my stomach. Something wasn't right. We decided to split up and search further. I went with Mark, moving deeper into the forest, while the others scoured the trails leading out from our campsite. As we walked, I noticed something strange, a piece of Emily's scarf snagged on a branch. It was odd because she always kept her scarf tied tightly. We followed the direction it seemed to lead, calling her name louder now, hoping for a response. Further along, we found more signs, a broken branch here, a footprint in the mud there. It felt as if we were being led somewhere. Then we saw it, an old, dilapidated cabin hidden among the trees. It looked abandoned, but there was something about it that sent a chill down my spine. We approached cautiously, the air heavy with dread. The door was slightly ajar. Inside, the cabin was dark and smelled of damp wood and something else I couldn't quite identify. As my eyes adjusted, I saw a makeshift bed in the corner, scraps of food, and personal items that didn't belong to any of us. This was someone's home, someone who wasn't far away. Then I saw it, Emily's bracelet on a small table. My heart pounded as I realized she had been here. We needed to find her quickly. We left the cabin and hurried back to our campsite to inform the others. The group reconvened, and we decided to search the area around the cabin. As we moved through the woods, we spotted a figure in the distance, an old man, hunched and ragged, watching us from behind a tree. He didn't run or hide. He just stood there, eyes locked on us. We tried to approach him, but he disappeared into the forest, moving surprisingly fast for someone his age. We followed, the forest growing denser and darker. Then we found a small clearing with a shallow pit. Inside the pit was Emily, tied up but unharmed, looking terrified. We quickly untied her and helped her out. Emily was shaken, but she managed to tell us that the hermit had taken her while she was washing up at the stream. He hadn't hurt her, but he had been acting erratically, talking to himself and muttering about needing company. With Emily safe, we made our way back to camp, keeping a wary eye out for the hermit. We packed up quickly, the eerie silence of the forest pressing in on us. As we left, I couldn't shake the feeling that the hermit was still watching us, hidden somewhere in the trees. We reported the incident to the authorities once we were back in town. They assured us they would search for the hermit, but deep down, I knew he would be hard to find in the vastness of the forest. The experience left a scar on all of us. We continued to camp and hike, but we were never as carefree as before. The memory of Emily's disappearance and the unsettling signs we had found stayed with us, a constant reminder of the hidden dangers that can lurk in the most unexpected places. We had chosen a secluded spot by the lake for our camping trip, 
hoping for a weekend of relaxation and fishing. The weather forecast had mentioned a slight chance of rain, but we were prepared for that. By the time we set up our tents and settled in, the sky was overcast, but nothing too worrying. As night fell, the wind began to pick up. We huddled around the campfire, cooking dinner and sharing stories. The first drops of rain started to fall, a light drizzle at first, then gradually heavier. We retreated to our tents, expecting the storm to pass quickly. But it didn't. The wind howled, shaking our tents violently. The rain turned into a torrential downpour, drumming relentlessly against the fabric of the tents. I could hear the ominous creaking of trees swaying in the gale. The ground beneath us quickly became waterlogged, and soon, small streams of water were flowing through our campsite. Lying in my tent, I felt a growing sense of dread. The storm was intensifying, and it showed no signs of letting up. Suddenly, a loud crack echoed through the night, followed by a heavy thud. A tree had fallen nearby, its branches scraping against my tent. Panic surged through me as I realized how dangerous our situation had become. We needed to act. I crawled out of my tent, the wind and rain lashing at me. The ground was a muddy mess, making it hard to move quickly. I saw my friends struggling to secure their tents, which were being battered by the storm. We worked together to reinforce the tent stakes, using rocks and fallen branches to add weight and stability. The flooding was getting worse. The water was rising fast, threatening to submerge our tents. We needed to find higher ground, but the darkness and the storm made it nearly impossible to see. The relentless wind made it hard to stay upright, and the rain was blinding. The thought of another tree falling filled me with dread. I remembered we had an emergency tarp in one of the packs. We used it to create a makeshift barrier against the wind and rain securing it with anything heavy we could find. It wasn't perfect, but it provided some protection. Then we had to think about signaling for help. Our phones had no signal, and the storm showed no signs of abating. I remembered seeing a flare gun in one of the emergency kits. We fired it into the sky, hoping that someone, anyone, might see it through the storm. Time dragged on. The storm raged, and we huddled together under the tarp, trying to stay warm and dry. The fear of another tree falling or the water rising further kept us on edge. Exhaustion set in, but we couldn't afford to rest. We had to stay alert. Hours later, just as the first light of dawn began to break through the clouds, we heard the faint sound of a helicopter. The flare had worked. We stumbled out into the clearing, waving frantically. The sight of the rescue team filled me with overwhelming relief. They helped us onto the helicopter, providing blankets and first aid. As we lifted off, I looked down at our campsite, now a flooded chaotic mess. The storm had wreaked havoc, but we had survived. Back at the rescue center, we were given hot drinks and dry clothes. The ordeal had left us shaken but grateful. The rescuers told us we were lucky to have fired the flare as it had been spotted by a ranger out on patrol. The experience left a mark on us all. Nature's power is awe-inspiring, but also terrifying. We learn to respect it more deeply, to prepare more thoroughly, and to never underestimate its potential for danger. Despite the fear and uncertainty of that night, we had managed to pull together and survive. And that was a testament to our resilience and the human spirit's will to endure.